Central Europe, 1704. An army from a grand coalition of Protestant nations comes head to head with the mighty French army near the town of Blindheim in southern Germany. Over 100,000 soldiers were marching to combat this day, and with the balance of power in the continent at stake, the outcome will have decisive implications for the next 100 years. By the turn of the 18th century, the Kingdom of France was now a European juggernaut with a near unrivaled economy, government, and military. Its size was matched by the ambitions of its leader, the Bourbon King, Louis XIV, who aspired to make his monarchy the dominant power of the world. This expansion had not gone unnoticed, making France's Protestant neighbors uneasy with the Catholic monarch, and fearing that war may soon be necessary to keep its ambitions at bay. The powder keg of this tense situation would ignite after the death of Charles II of Spain in 1700. The Spanish Empire, stretching as far west as the Americas and as far east as Italy, was ruled by the infamous Habsburg dynasty, whose direct line ended after Charles' death, putting its territorial integrity in jeopardy. The most effective way to keep the empire together was to pass the dynastic torch to Philip of Anjou, the most direct hereditary line to the Spanish throne, and also grandson to Louis XIV. Such an association would give Louis dominance of all Spanish territory and transform France into a Catholic superstate. Louis would accept this treaty despite his European neighbors also claiming rights to the Spanish throne, sparking a chain of events that would initiate the War of Spanish Succession. As the nations of Europe mobilized for war in 1702, alliances would be drawn along a mix of religious and territorial lines. France would be allied with Spain, Portugal, and Hungarian revolutionaries in the east who used this war as an opportunity to break themselves from Habsburg rule. Then there was the opposition, the Grand Alliance, which consisted of various Protestant nations such as the Netherlands, the English Isles, Savoy, Austria, and the Holy Roman Empire. However, Despite its massive size, the Holy Roman Empire was largely a mix of independent elector states whose alliance varied from province to province. In this case, the states of Cologne and Bavaria would ally themselves with France and Spain instead of their German neighbors. The disunification of the Grand Alliance prevented them from developing a cohesive strategy and would initially aim to achieve smaller victories such as seizing French and Spanish forts along their borders. Efforts that were more of a nuisance than a winning strategy. Louis XIV would attempt to use this disunification to his advantage. If he could contain the Anglo-Dutch forces in the north and use the Hungarian revolt to delay the Allies in the east, he could march his army straight into the heart of the empire with little opposition and strike a knockout blow to the Allies by seizing the capital of Vienna and forcing a peace. Such a strategy put the Grand Alliance in grave danger. Without the ability to easily mass their forces, victory seemed hopeless. But they had a secret weapon on their side. His name was John Churchill, the Duke of Marlborough. By 1702, Churchill was already a skilled and proven military leader. Having received numerous accolades throughout previous conflicts, his ability to command troops in combat was beyond question. His military career was not without controversy, though. He would frequently make enemies with high-ranking officials, leading to his eventual dismissal from the military and even prison time. However, by the war's outbreak, all issues between him and the nobility would be resolved and he was placed in command of British forces in Europe. By 1704, the Grand Alliance won some impressive victories against the Franco-Spanish alliance in the Netherlands and Italy. Impressive enough to cause Portugal to switch sides after the British victory at Vigo Bay. The French would also win numerous victories along the Danube and Rhine rivers, Areas that would allow Louis' armies freedom of maneuver to accomplish their ultimate goal of seizing Vienna. Seeing the situation as it was, 
Churchill decided that his campaign in the Low Countries would not be sufficient to stop what was happening and decided to act. Having been given command of all Allied forces in the region, he made a bold and risky move. He and an army of 21,000 English, Scottish, and Dutch soldiers marched southeast from the city of Bedburg. Other members of the Alliance were uneasy with this maneuver. The loss of such an army would not only be devastating to the war effort, but it could happen in a single day, making the dangerous and costly journey worthless. Their concerns were not unfounded. French commanders had been made aware of this army and did everything they could to keep a close eye on it. However, neither they nor the British and Allied soldiers themselves had any idea what this army's final destination was. As Marlborough marched south, his goal was to mislead both his enemies and his allies. The belief was that he would march the army directly into France on any number of points. He would even capitalize on this belief by bridging certain areas to give the false impression that he would do such a thing. It was all a ruse. His true destination? The Danube River on the outskirts of Bavaria, essentially blocking the path to Vienna. With this turn of events, and Marlborough effectively threatening to force Bavaria out of the war, Louis acted quickly, sending the marshal of his military, the Duc de Talard, to mass his forces and smash Churchill's army. Talard moved quickly despite the many rivers in the area, and made it to Marlborough's destination in August near the town of Blindheim along the Danube River. Talard and his army arrived in high spirits but they knew that the force they would go up against would be more than a match for them. The coalition army under Marlborough was not the 21,000 strong force that left Bedburg months earlier. In fact, it had almost tripled in size. During his march south, soldiers from across the coalition joined his campaign swelling his army to 52,000 men and 66 guns. Among these new joins was Eugene of Savoy and his army of 28,000 German veterans, providing a wealth of numbers, tactical expertise, and experience to the rest of the army. Additionally, Marlborough proved to be a cunning logistician, meaning that by the time he made it to the Danube, his army was well-fed, well-supplied, and well maintained despite laying siege to the Bavarian countryside while waiting for the French army. Tillard would prove to be not as skilled a logistician as Marlborough, but would eventually get his army to the Danube and with greater numbers than his opponent, thanks to his Bavarian allies and a contingent of Irish soldiers known as the Wild Geese, who altogether would grow his numbers to 56,000 men and 90 guns. On the morning of 13 August, the French would awake to find Marlborough's army in sight of their location, and immediately deployed into a defensive posture. Tillard's forces were located with the Danube to their east, and the Neville River to their north. Tillard would spread his divisions across three towns that dotted the area, Lutzingen to the west, Oberglau in the center, and Blindheim to the east. Marlborough, north of the Neville River, would position his forces parallel to the French. He himself would command the left flank near the Danube, while Eugene of Savoy would command the right. As orders were given to deploy, over 100,000 soldiers from across Europe would move to their respective locations. Despite the vast mix of nationalities of these soldiers, there were similar standards of dress, organization, and armament that were common across the battlefield. The average foot soldiers would have typically worn a tricorn hat and colored uniform. For the British, the red coat was well established, while the French were adopting the white appearance. Each infantryman would have carried with them a flintlock musket, capable of firing three shots a minute at an effective range of less than 100 yards. Additionally, a blade known as the bayonet was added to the standard musket giving each soldier the ability to engage with and destroy the enemy at a distance and in close combat if necessary. In addition to various types of cavalry and artillerymen, the upcoming day was guaranteed to be a bloodbath. As the sun rose over the horizon, 
Both sides initiated a horrific barrage of cannon fire upon each other. For about four hours, both sides took cover and exchanged shot for shot, sending iron balls across the Neville River to soften defenses and horrify the recipients. Despite the barrage, all forces were in place by around noon. Marlborough would delay no longer and ordered his forces to attack. Marlborough's army would advance across all fronts towards the towns where the French were deployed. The Neville River in the center would be a major obstacle though and his forces would rely on bridges in order to get across. The first action would occur on the eastern flank the city of Blindheim itself. Leading the assault was Lord John Cutts, who would march his battalions across a single bridge and directly into the teeth of the French defenses. The defenders of Blindheim would send volley after volley of hot lead directly into the oncoming British ranks, cutting them down by the scores as they deployed into their battle formations. Under intense musket and cannon barrages, the British marched up to about 60 paces from the city before they returned fire in an effort to mass their firepower. The losses the British suffered would be heavy, forcing them to withdraw, regroup, and re-attack on numerous occasions. Seeing the beleaguered forces struggle to gain ground, the French saw the opportunity for a counterattack to send Blindheim's attackers into a full retreat. Squadrons of elite French cavalry known as the Gendarmerie charged forward to carry out this task. Meeting them was the English cavalry, sent forward to disrupt the counterattack. French cavalry tactics at the time placed emphasis on the pistol being the weapon to first engage the enemy. English cavalry, on the other hand, placed their emphasis on the saber, riding in at a trot and then closing the distance quickly to shatter the opponent with sheer brute force. The result was devastating and the Gendarmerie were forced to withdraw. In response to the heavy attacks on Blindheim, reserve battalions of French infantry were ordered to reinforce the city, believing that more troops were needed. However, these reinforcements were proving to be more of a hindrance to the defenders, taking up needed space without providing much additional combat power. As fighting for the city of Blindheim continued into the afternoon, both sides on the western flank would soon collide. Having just finished the time-consuming crossing of the Neville River, Eugene of Savoy led his multinational force against the dug-in and fortified French and Bavarian defenders, who were well supported by interlocking sectors of intense artillery fire. At this point in the battle, differences in firing drills between the two forces became more apparent. Tallard's army employed the fire by rank model, firing the entire front rank of soldiers at once. In such case, the front rank would fire their weapons, be replaced by the second rank who would fire their weapons, and so on. Doing so would enable an entire row of soldiers to discharge their muskets at once, but would result in a large delay between volleys. Marlborough's army, however, would employ the platoon firing model, in which the formations would fire by platoon after platoon, resulting in a steady and never-ceasing volume of fire that ensured a constant stream of shot being sent towards the targets. Despite superior firing methods, the coalition army could not break the western flank, resulting in a war of attrition in which Eugene would attack and re-attack multiple times to achieve his goals. As the fighting increased along the flanks, 
Marlboro Center started crossing the river towards Oberglau. To accomplish this, squadrons of cavalry outfitted with engineering equipment spent hours building various types of crossings in support of the advancing forces. These crossings enabled the army to make their way to the other side of the river, but at an incredibly slow pace. During the crossing, Talard's forces would hold fast and only harass the army. His belief was that if his army overwhelmed Marlborough's forces while the river was to their back, then they would not have an avenue of escape, causing a panic and hastening their destruction. His belief was not unfounded. As the struggling army moved across the river, they were easy targets for an encirclement. Marlborough grew weary with this predicament and sent forward a contingent of troops led by the Dutch Prince of Holstein Beck to disrupt French forces in Oberglau in order to enable his center to cross. This maneuver would nearly cost him the battle. As battalions of troops moved towards Oberglau, Tillard's regiments of the wild geese mixed with squadrons of cavalry charged forward. The intense fury of the wild geese stopped the allies in their tracks, forcing the prince to withdraw back across the nettle. With Holstein Beck's forces retreating, Tillard saw an opportunity. If he could puncture the allied line in the northern center, he could isolate Eugene's forces and divide the army in two. Marlborough acted immediately and moved his cavalry forward to reinforce the line. This maneuver would be successful, but it wasn't until Eugene's squadrons of Carassier joined the fight that the wild geese would officially withdraw back into Oberglau. By the late afternoon, aside from the routing of both the wild geese and the gendarmerie, Talar's forces were holding their ground against Marlborough's army, but were disproportionately occupying the cities while spread thin in between them. Marlborough had suffered immense casualties so far, but was renewing his attacks against the flanks and firing fresh salvos of cannon fire in support of them. In the center, his forces had finally finished the time-consuming crossing of the river, but with the river now to their backs, they were without an avenue of escape. Their attack would be against Talard's forces in between Blindheim and Oberglau in an all-or-nothing maneuver that could be catastrophic if executed poorly. Standing in front of them were squadrons of French cavalry and nine infantry battalions who would attempt to break their assault and push them into the river. Marching forward, both sides would lead with their cavalry and punch straight into each other. But as they marched forward, Marlborough did something unexpected. He pulled his cavalry behind his infantry and moved his cannons loaded with partridge shot to the front and unleashed hell on the French. French infantry, most of them conscripts, stood bravely to hold back the English. But the overwhelming amount of gunfire sent them reeling back in droves. The French center was breaking. With this new development, Marlborough sent the majority of his forces forward to finish off his enemy.
Marlborough's army exploited its recent advantage, Talard's forces began to retreat. With the center evaporated, the left flank now began to fall back under the weight of Eugene's forces. Those who were able to withdraw with their lives were the lucky ones. The same cannot be said of the French troops trapped within the furnace of Blindheim. Now completely surrounded, Talard's forces were unable to retreat and formed into tight groups within the town which was ablaze with fire and smoke. English forces fired volley after volley of shot into the beleaguered forces. And after hours of defending themselves, the remainder of French troops held up in the city finally surrendered. By the end of that violent day, 10,000 soldiers lay dead on the battlefield with many more wounded. The French army suffered most, with 27,000 soldiers killed, wounded, or captured. Among those captured was the general himself, the Duc de Talard. The dead scattered this battlefield far and wide, with many who even drowned in the river, burned to death, or trampled by stampeding horses. What took place at this unknown group of towns close to the Danube River would be named the Battle of Blenheim, and is the site where Louis XIV's illusion of invincibility was shattered. Following this defeat, the French monarch faced the realization that a larger, much more violent conflict lay before him, and both he and the Duke of Marlborough began to call for more troops to continue what was to be a long and bloody campaign. But it would be much more than that. The armies of England and France marched against each other in the war that would last 11 more years. They would join a legacy of warriors that have been fighting since the year 1066 and would continue fighting intermittently for the next 100 years.